to our second session of our community day. We welcome Darvina from Sequoia Audubon Society. Yay. Yay. Okay. Well, good morning. And thank you to Bruce Utech at the Redwood City Parks Recreation and Community Services and Travande for inviting Sequoia Audubon Society to participate in community days, and especially to those of you out there for joining us today. My name is Davina Gentry, and I'm the Administrative Assistant for Sequoia Audubon Society. Doug Brown, our Outreach Coordinator, is, is unable to join us today, but will be participating in our future sessions. Yay. We couldn't possibly tell you everything there is to know about birds in three sessions, but we hope to give you a good overview of common birds in San Mateo County and how you can attract and enjoy them. Let's get going. San Mateo, uh, pardon me, Sequoia Audubon Society is the San Mateo County chapter of the National Audubon Society. We've been organized since 1949 in the county and celebrated our 70th anniversary in 2019. We offer field trips, monthly meetings with engaging speakers and educational programs. Additionally, how we have what's called a cavity nesters recovery program that carefully places nesting boxes in parks, cemeteries and golf courses to establish nest box trails of cavity nesting birds. Volunteer monitors then check those boxes weekly during the nesting season and document activity to report to the California Bluebird Recovery Program. This way we can support and hopefully increase an otherwise declining species due to habitat loss. One does not have to be a member to join us, however. I will encourage your support our senior membership is only $15 a year and $25 for family. On our website, you can find previous Zoom recordings with various topics, everything from natural history, birding Monaco to skunks. At the bottom of our homepage is what you'll find the San Mateo County Birding Guide. You can see it here with all the various little pins on it. I encourage you to explore it and even zoom in on your own neighborhood. The pins that you see on it represent bird sightings that have been reported on eBird. And we'll get more into that a little bit later. But I want to familiarize you with the three regions. That is, the Bayshore, Skyline Foothills, and Coastside. We're incredibly fortunate that there are so many rich and diverse habitats in San Mateo County. It's one of the reasons that we have so many different species of birds here. Another reason that we can see so many species is because the San Francisco Bay, and especially the Central Valley, are part of what's known as the Pacific Flyaway. As you can tell from this map, there are four significant flyaways that route across Northern America. The majority of these migrating species are going much further south to complete their migration. Let's discover some of the birds you'll likely see bayside. Something you may notice on many shorebirds is their longer bills. They use them for finding food, such as small invertebrates in the mud. The American avocet uses its bill to sweep the mud back and forth, while others use it to probe. Most of the year, both the male and female avocet are black and white, looking very similar. Yet in the breeding season, the male develops quite the rusty head. Here's another black and white bird, yet there's something very distinctive about this beauty. 
Do you notice the bright bubblegum pink legs? They really stand out. You can also see why it's named black necked stilt. The killdeer will live near the water along sloughs, creeks, and fields. They have a bold black two collar band and get their name from their shrill call. I'll play it for you. Well, if I can get it to play, come on, play. Darn it. Let me make sure this volume's up on the sound here. Ah. Well, we'll move on. I'll work on the sounds. <laughs> if you happen to get too close to a nesting killdeer, they will feign wing injury, flapping around, pretending to have a broken wing, and move in a different direction to get you to move away from their nest. Oh, there was the call. <laughs> the killdeer, the killdeer will live near the water along, pardon me, <laughs> let's move on. Uh, our marbled godwit is one of the largest shorebirds with a bicolored bill ranging from pink to orange. They have a beautiful pattern on the back, don't they? You'll notice the wimbrel has what's called a down curved bill. It's one of our largest shorebirds with a 17 inch wingspan. The duller willet has a very distinctive white pattern on the wing, making it easier to identify. You'll often find them flying in large flocks. One of our migratory ducks is the northern shoveler. They're given that name because of their large spoon-like bill that has sieve-like edges that help the birds sift through water and mud for food. You'll see them swishing from side to side as they feed. The male has a gorgeous green head and chestnut flanks. If you happen to catch one flying overhead, you can certainly make out the spoon-like shape of the bill. Mallards, one of our common resident year-round ducks. You can see why they're called greenheads. The male is quite gregarious and will even mate with other species, which can make for some very challenging identification at times. This duck gets its head from its outsized buffalo head that's iridescent black and has a large white patch. Can you see the purple greenish iridescent color here? Generally, males are more colorful because they have to compete with other males to attract a mate. And females even prefer the brighter colors. While dull females are able to easily hide while being on the nest. I bet you've all seen this bird in the transmission towers along the San Mateo Bridge. The double breast crested cormorant can be identified from other marine cormorants by the crook in its neck. You'll see them with their wings spread after diving for food, drying off. They don't have oil in their feathers the way most ducks do, so they have to spread their wings to dry off between feedings. Now we'll move inland. Here's the poster child for the motto, the early bird gets the worm. The robin can be found early morning searching warns for, for food. They have a beautiful melodious song.
The Buick's wren is a smaller, thin bird with a long, almost upright tail that has black and white bars underneath. You can just make them out in this photo. They have a longer bill for finding small insects in your garden, probing in the shrubbery. You'll even find them hunting for bugs and cobwebs. Their large white eyebrow makes them easy to identify. Probably one of our noisier neighbors is the Western scrub jay. These guys are very common and widespread throughout California. Although you wouldn't find them in the desert or in dense forest. They are in the corvid family that consists of jays, crows, and ravens. I have a resident pair in my yard I named Frick and Frack. We've gotten them to come for peanuts. Here is a short video. That is so uh, funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's play. Come on, play. Oh, dang it. Oh, 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 sorry. Oh, my goodness. Um, Tina, did I lose my presenter's view? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, live view fudge. now. Fudge. I don't know how I managed to do that. That's okay. Pardon me. Let me go right back to my slideshow here. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Oh my gosh. So, so we're going to watch this. Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and um, now I got it. Our chestnut back chickadee. Hold on just a second. Let me get back to my presenter's view. Okay. <laughs> You'll find this handsome little bird flitting about in the yard, matching the trees it lives among with its black cap, chestnut back, and gray flanks. Listen for their chickadee call. They're pretty easy to hear. You're most likely to see this otherwise secretive songbird during spring on top of bushes, singing its heart out in search of a mate. The spotted towhee is one of our ground foraging and ground nesting birds. They like to hide in the brush like juniper. It's a gorgeous bird with a gleaming black head and red piercing eyes. Moving into denser forested areas near water, you might come across this brightly colored bird. You'd think it might be easy to see, but it is easily camouflaged in trees. This black capped warbler is one of our smallest and most recognizable. They rarely slow down, dashing between branches, gleaning insects for their food. The acorn woodpecker is only found in oak woodland habitats since it relies on acorns and bugs that eat oaks. They store acorns in holes they drill in called granaries. That is trees and poles where they use this as food during the winter. They live in large flocks and have a fascinating social life. One group member is always on guard while the others race through the trees giving their parrot-like waka waka calls. Birders joke about them having a clown-like appearance. One of several swallow species we have, this one, the barn swallow, makes a cup-shaped mud and grass nest on buildings and bridges. Barn swallows love the insects that we humans don't like, especially mosquitoes, gnats, and flying termites. 
a single barn swallow can consume 60 insects per hour or a whopping 850 a day. That's 25,000 fewer insects per month that otherwise might have joined your summer barbecue. This fantastic larger brown bird is in the woodpecker family. But unlike woodpeckers that forage in trees, these guys forage on the ground, feeding on ants and insects. When they fly, you'll see a flash of reddish orange under the wing. If you were on the East Coast, you'd see the yellow shafted flicker with yellow under the wings. You're likely to find them at the forest edge. Another one of the noisier jays, you generally find the Stellar's jay in our denser forested areas. They stick to the higher canopy in trees, but are easy to find with their loud calls. They're quite unique with their crested head. There's only two jays in the world with crested heads, and the Stellar's is one of them. One of our more common year-round residents, the snowy egret, is named for the fine feathery plumage it develops during the breeding season. These graceful plumes once fetched astronomical prices endangering the species. It's a smaller egret with what we like to refer to as golden slippers on its feet making it a little easier to identify. Now, the much larger great egret you'll notice has all black legs and feet with a yellow bill. It has an impressive wingspan of 54 inches. One of the oldest environmental organizations in the United States, the National Audubon Society was founded in 1905 to stop the harvest of egret plumes for use on hats and dresses. The species now serves as its symbol. Here's a comparison of the snowy and the great egret. Sequoia Audubon Society chose the pygmy nuthatch for its logo. It's the smallest of our nuthatches. They can be found in flocks, usually up in trees. They like conifers, eucalyptus, and cypress. Occasionally, you'll see them at beaters. As California state bird, this board, gorgeous bird can be found at the shrubby forest edge. They have a rusty belly, that is surrounded by a scaly pattern on the feathers. The male top knot, while looking like one feather, is actually six. Birders refer to what their spark bird is. That is, which bird sparked their interest to learn more? Well, this one is my spark bird. Do you have one now? If not, I encourage you to discover which one piques your interest. The male red-winged blackbird displays a large red shoulder patches or epaulets during breeding season to attract a mate. You'll find them singing their hearts out on top of the reeds during the breeding season as well. Our year round most common hummingbird is the Anna's hummingbird. You can see the raspberry colored feathers on the male's gorget and iridescent emerald green feathers. They're beautiful, striking little birds, very territorial and very fiercely brave defending their territory. 
Now, the Allen's hummingbird is a migratory hummingbird into our county that you'd only see on the coast late winter into summer. It's an amazing rufous and emerald green color. Hard to miss, perched on top of birch bushes. The turkey vulture is what we call the scavenger of the skies. It is a large dark bird with what almost looks like fingers at its wingtips. They have a red featherless head and fly teetering with very few wing beats. They have keen vision and an incredible sense of smell, enabling to them to find carrion, that is roadkill, up to a mile away. They perform a very important ecological function in our ecosystem, removing decaying animals, which helps prevent the spread of disease. The great blue heron is the largest of our herons and is very adaptable. You might see them hunting small fish or frogs in wetlands or hunting bulls and gophers in fields. So you're likely to see this beauty on either side of the coastal range. Coast side, you'll find the very large, what some consider almost prehistoric looking brown pelican. It dives for its food and currently with abundant food supplies over in Half Moon Bay of anchovies and sardines, you can see lots of them right now. The black oyster catcher is a very unique bird of the rocky coastline because they can be found feeding on small shellfish like limpets. So that long bill comes in handy. You'll see them in pairs having a large raucous call. The American kestrel is a very striking bird and the smallest of our falcons at only 10 and a half inches high. They hunt bulls and small insects. The white-tailed kite, like the kestrel, will hover over its prey while hunting. An elegant slim raptor with white body and gray underneath and somewhat easy to spot with these two white dark spots on the wing. If you happen to be over on the coast, the wave crest field south of Half Moon Bay is a great place to see these kites and raptors. One of our most common raptors, the red-tailed hawk, can also be one of the trickiest to identify between immatures and adults and their individual variation. Even ranging is what in what is called light morph to dark morph. Although one of its identifying field marks is the belly band, which I will show you here across the belly here. Can you see it in that? The red-shouldered hawk is very striking it's and very has helpful. very, he's got strong black and white banding on both the wing and the tail. You can see and understand how it got its name, can't you? One distinguishing field mark of the Northern Harrier is the white rump at the base of the tail. The male of the species is referred to as a gray ghost, as you can see, 
while the female is actually brown with a white rump. They fly low over fields looking for voles, mice, and gophers. Now, we talked a little bit at the beginning about the San Mateo Birding Guide and pins with people using eBirds. What was once called citizen science is now referred to as community science because we all as a community can contribute to the scientist database. These are applications for your phone or programs for your computer that you can use. One can download eBird and go out to a park open up the application and it will determine your location and upload what we call the package of species that you're most likely to see in the area, making it much easier to try and identify the birds. Unlike some field guides that you may pick up that's got every species in the world in it. One reason why we prefer to use more localized field guides that I'll talk about in a little bit. But eBird, as you go along, you can just indicate whether or not you've seen the bird or how many you've seen, or you can get down into the nitty gritty and learn about breeding codes and enter, whether you see parents feeding or nestlings leaving their nest or what we call fledglings, those immature birds that have moved out of the nest and begin to venture on their own. iNaturalist can also be used for birds, but if you enjoy all things in nature, this is great because you can record everything from insects to butterflies to fungi to lichen, you name it. And if you don't happen to know what the species is, that you're logging, you simply take a picture of it and a naturalist, a scientist, some expert in the field is going to engage and identify that species for you. So it's a great learning tool. Now, so far as field guides, we're fortunate that one of our local residents in Half Moon Bay, Alvaro Jamillo, has written a book for the American Birding Association called Birding, uh, Birds of California. And I found it very helpful to focus on learning just the birds of California when I began birding in San Mateo County 13 years ago. So I would encourage you to look for that book if you don't have a local field guide and are interested in learning. Um, in fact, Alvaro Jamil is the consulting biologist for Sequoia Audubon Society. And in September at our monthly meeting, he will be presenting about raptors in San Mateo County. It is the second Thursday of the month on Thursday, September 8th. We will be hosting this meeting live and in person at the San Mateo, County, San Mateo Garden Center in San Mateo. And you're welcome to join us. As I mentioned before, you don't have to be a member to join us on field trips or at our meetings. This is our mission statement. And if you enjoy conservation, education, and advocating for those species that can't speak for themselves, I would encourage you to get involved. We're seeking new volunteers and new board members and are always welcoming people. No matter if they live in San Mateo County, Santa Clara County, or San Francisco County, you're welcome to come and join Sequoia Audubon Society. I will take some questions and answers now.
if there are any here. Let's see, Tina, are you monitoring our chat? I'm, I'm, I'm here. Uh, oh. I'm here, Paul. Okay. Yeah, there is one question on the chat. Uh, I love Blue Jays. How can I get more in our yard? <laughs> <laughs> Well, in fact, in our next series, we're going to talk about how you can attract birds to your yard, both with water features and by using different feeders. Um, if you happen to have some in your yard currently, you might just put out um, in a very conspicuous location some shelled peanuts. Um, they like to cache them away and use them for future food. Um, they're pretty territorial. So I, if you get a pair like I got into my yard, I was fortunate last summer, um, whom I named Frick and Frack, it turned out, well, Frick and Frack had babies this spring. <laughs> so I now have four Jays in the yard, but they don't like to have other jays around. They're territorial. So if you've got one pair around, start trying to feed them. And um, with any luck, next breeding season, you'll have more than two. And I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with Birders Garden in San Carlos, it is a wonderful resource uh, for birds and learning about different bird foods. Um, go to Birders Garden and Bonnie and her staff there can help you get set up. And they're a great resource for us to have. Okay. So there's lots more questions. Let me see. Uh, are birds intelligent? <laughs> Uh, most are very intelligent. Um, and there have been studies done that the corvids, that is the jays, crows, and ravens are the most intelligent. Um, you can Google crows and see videos of where they've managed to teach crows to use sticks as tools. Um, operate within a maze. They're amazing. And they're so intelligent that you really don't want to upset them, disturb them, or make them angry in any way because they will remember you and they will come after you. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. They remember a face <laughs> and they will remember, they will pass that memory on to their children. Oh my so, goodness. You want to be careful with the Corvettes. <laughs> um, thank you for the answer. Very interesting. <laughs> I won't mess with a bird. <laughs> <laughs> Not those anyway. <laughs> uh, and let me, let me inject here because we've seen media reports about crows coming in and wrecking havoc in cities. And, um, different techniques that people try to eliminate them. Well, the going with lasers are frowned upon, certainly because you don't want to be pointing a laser up in the sky, but because you could also blind a bird using a laser. At Birders Garden, they sell what's known as a scarecrow. That is a plastic feathered crow that looks like it's dead. You could put it in your yard and the crows will have a funeral for it and you will then have fewer crows in your yard if they come back at all. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, the city of Sunnyvale bought a whole bunch of their scarecrows and used them recently. <laughs> wow. Wow. And you get it from uh, where Home Depot, did you say? No, from Birders Garden is the best resource Birders in St. Parler. Okay, yep. Birders Garden is okay. Uh, we have another question from Kimberly. I would love to know some pro about pro tips about sounds my crows that talk to me. I toss them peanuts and they protect my chicken from hawks. For a while, they even adopted a crackle, crank, crackle to oh. their family. Okay. Oh, now she mentions a grackle and that's what's called a great tail crackle. Really uncommon um, in the area. Um, 
you know, um, there are some great books. There was a great book about crows and ravens. Um, I wish I could remember the title of it right now. Um, I'm sure if you were to Google it, um, it probably will come up. Um, they, you know, crows make um, their cawing sound, yet crows have a more deep guttural like sound. They certainly don't sound like crows. They don't, by comparison, they don't make a lot of noise. Um, but I have seen reports where people will get them to almost nuzzle up and make almost like a humming sound. Um, if you're really into crows on Facebook, there's a great um, Corvid and Crow, we love COVID and Corvids and Crows Facebook group that you can look up. Thank you. Uh, one more, uh, all we see in our yards are uh, Junkos, Oak, Tintmouse, and Townies, Redwood City. You didn't show them. That was the comment. Um, well, so we have a flyer that we've created called the 70 Common Birds of San Mateo County. Uh, for today's presentation, I didn't choose some of the more common ones. Um, because I like to engage people with some of the most unusual and more colorful ones. But in our next presentation, I will focus on the more common ones we see in our yard, since we will be talking about feeders and water features and how to attract more to the yard. Um, the Junko, um, let me in fact, see, um, I might, while we talk here, let's see if I can't actually pull up uh, some other pictures of some, um, no, it's going to be too hard for me to share at this point, but. Um, That's okay, maybe. We'll, have, we'll have lots of pictures yep. of the Junkos. Uh, the Junko that she mentions uh -huh. is actually a small dark headed bird that you see jumping along the ground. Um, they're grayish. One of the easiest ways to identify the junco is they have um, white outside edge on their tail feathers. So when you see them flying off, you'll see that little flash of white on the tail. The oak titmouse itself is um, a gray, small gray, rather dull bird, makes a cute little sound. Um, and the other toey that she's referring to, the California toey, is a rather drab, large, almost football shaped bird with a long tail. They're really cute when they first leave the nest because they don't look like toeys. Their tail grows out with age. It looks more like a little football. I see that um, Sunny asked about that website to join the society. Sequoia Audubon's website is sequoia-audubon.org. Audubon.org, okay. And yes, birds really sing. Uh, so they're sing, they just don't make noise. Interesting, wow. Well, they sing and they have calls. Mm. Um, and they have, some have many more calls than others. Um, for example, the Buick's Wren that I showed you, they have several calls, um, as does the Junko that we just talked about. Um, you can go, there's numerous websites you can learn from. Uh, Cornell has a great website. Um, another one, allaboutbirds.org. And you could simply Google um, San Mateo County birds and find what birds you'll see in San Mateo County. We're in the process of updating our website and um, we will be posting the 70 common birds of San Mateo County flyer there. 
if you would like to receive that flyer, I will add to the chat um, my email address in the chat box. And if you want me to send you the 70 common birds flyer that we put together, um, I invite you to shoot me an email. And that's correct. Oh, thank you, Tina, for including those other sites. Um, I had, and Sunny also mentions cats. They will kill the birds in our yard. And that's something I intend to cover in the next series. Great. Um, and the next series is next month. Is next month. Um, yep. On our next community, mm -hmm. August 24th. August 24th. Actually, I'm sorry, August 17th. August 17th. Yep. And the third series is on September 21st. Is that yes. right? <laughs> yep, that'd be great. And then uh, there was one comment. Uh, Kimberly said, I love my crows. They bring me presents of shiny gifts. What kind of gifts? And I give them soft shell eggs that one of my old chicken lay. Oh, you are so lucky, Kimberly. Um, I've tried befriending a crow in my yard who seems to have a lame foot. I call him Gimpy. Um, he hasn't started bringing me gifts, but he has started taking peanuts. This is something people have been known to develop real relationships with birds in the Corvid family. And they will, people say, bring you gifts. That is um, maybe a shiny rock, maybe even some shiny little trinket they found in the street. But they like to bring gifts to those that provide for them. That is cute. Never knew that. Wow. I see Bruce has his hand up. That's you me. A question? Yeah, I have a question and a couple of comments. Um, yes, the, sir. The stuffed animal crow thing does work. I was mortified <laughs> because our, it was either a crow or a raven. We're not sure, but he came down and ate the babies out of the birdhouse one time, and we had some little chickadees in there. So I put one of those up, and they don't they don't come around anymore. <laughs> um, and so about 10, 15 years ago, Nova had um, on KQED had a really good hour long uh, documentary about the crows and the ravens and about the guy who put the mask on and tracked that, 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 that's, that's still, you can see that on YouTube. Um, then, um, can you talk a little bit more about the, um, the box, the, the bird boxes that you have, because we're having a gigantic two-story building being built and we would have a, uh, like a rooftop garden and we want to make it a, a monarch butterfly trail and also we could put a bird box up there in in the park oh great um that's wonderful to hear bruce um so, you know we could we could talk offline about that but the yes, one we question can. Did, did do you have any information about the lack of migrating canadian geese or i mean lack of them migrating and that they're staying here more throughout the year instead of going back to canada would you want to go back to a snowy climate if you okay, lived in that, California? That, that's what we had figured it was because they, they stop in the parks. And then what happens is they they go to the bathroom on the turf and then yeah. they kind of be aggressive. So I just wondering if you guys had ever mentioned, talked about that. Um, so um, there, we seem to have more pairs that are sticking around and have become resident birds. We can work with you about solutions to discourage them. Uh, Foster City currently is um, seeking methods to remove them, some of which have prompted a public outcry using lethal methods which we would not encourage, of no, course. That's not, that's not okay. Um, we're all about protecting migratory species. There is what's known as the Migratory Bird Treaty Act mm -hmm. that protects them. Um, you know, in fact, I just recently met with the um, Union Cemetery Historical Association about putting both bluebird boxes and barn owl boxes on at the cemetery 
So we'll be installing some nest boxes there in the next couple of months. Excellent. Um, I've been working with the um, with the wonderful woman at the Parks Department in Public Works um, on uh, establishing where we're going to put those boxes. So our cavity nester program, um, we, as I had mentioned, we have monitors that create these trails where um, we will hung up boxes for cavity nesting birds. We like to encourage Western bluebirds, but we will also work with tree swallows, American kestrel, and barn swallows. We've installed barn swallow boxes, two of them at Crystal Springs Golf Course, and two of them over on a coast side farm property that had quite the rodent property. Excellent. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know who you're talking about um, for the uh, Union Cemetery project. So um, yeah. yay. And so uh, you'll see our boxes hanging up uh, by late fall in Union Cemetery if you like to go there. Sure. Okay. And then uh, we can talk about putting those up here at the in the new senior center because we do have western bluebirds here out in our in our uh trees out here and i know they're very rare so excellent Great. presentation and thank you thank you thank you thank you Great. so much davina we'll see you next time thank you thank you all very much for joining us thank you take care take care bye-bye